After Halloween was a huge hit, it was only a matter of time before another one was made. Even though he tried to pass on being involved, John Carpenter would end up being tasked with writing, producing, and even directing some scenes during reshoots. What ends up becoming Halloween 2 would actually cause problems with the series for its entire run. Just about every contrived plot point in the series can be drawn back to this movie. Except for that whole, you know, Cult of Thorn thing, which we will dig into in its own episode of what the f happened to this horror movie. While this movie does often get overlooked in the rankings of the series, it does offer some interesting things. But the road to get there was fraught with problems behind the camera. With Halloween 2018's reset, we are now seeing an alternate reality where Laurie Strode didn't go to the hospital and have to fight off Michael Myers once again. Could the entire series, up until the 2018 film, just be a fever dream of a young Laurie Strode while recuperating in the hospital? Her vivid imagination playing all sorts of tricks on her? Even reimagining it a couple of times? But for now, let's go back to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital and find out what the f*** happened to Halloween 2. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. In Halloween 2, we open with the events from the end of the first film. Michael has been shot six times and falls off the balcony only to disappear. Weirdly, in the original film, we hear six shots. While at the beginning of this film, we hear seven. Loomis, though, confirms he shot him six times, as told by his frantic interaction with the police. I shot him six times! 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 He has obviously lost it by this point. His calm demeanor has been thrown away, and he is in full-blown panic mode. As much credit as Donald Pleasance gets for his first portrayal as the good doctor in part one, his descent into a more frantic and exposed character in the sequel is impressive and should get more praise than it does. Meanwhile, Laurie is taken to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital. There we meet a colorful crew of hospital staff. Laurie is sedated and spends the rest of the film in a hazy dream state. While out walking around town feeling good about himself, Michael runs into a boy listening to a boombox that I totally wanted when I was a kid. Jealousy is not a good look for me. But Michael learns about Laurie's whereabouts during a news report on the radio and makes his way to the hospital to finally finish what he started. While out chasing down Michael, Dr. Loomis ends up at a grade school that had been broken into. There he finds the word Sam Hain written in blood on the chalkboard. He also mispronounces it as it should be Sawin. Sam Hain, it means the Lord of the Dead. But he's a bit preoccupied at the moment, so we'll give him a pass. It's also here that the nurse from the first movie shows up to drop an exposition bomb on the good doctor. It's here that we find out Lori is actually adopted and is Michael's sister. With this, Loomis heads off to the hospital where he finds Michael has gone on another killing spree while Lori has stumbled around all doped up and had flashes of the fact that she sort of knew she was Michael's sister all along. Everything culminates in an explosive finale that kills off both Loomis and Michael for good. And the confirmation needed is the flame shooting out of Michael's skull dead is dead. Well, it was supposed to be anyway, but we're about to see the 12th movie in the franchise hit theaters, so yeah. John Carpenter had no interest in returning to the Halloween franchise, but when someone suggested he should stay on as producer, he looked at it as a way to get some of the money he felt he was owed from the original movie while also helping a young filmmaker get started in the business as the first film had done for him. He was tasked with writing the film, and he really had no idea where to go. He decided to set it on the same night as the first film. Start with the mystery of where Michael ended up after he fell off the balcony. After a while, he became stuck and didn't know how to proceed. One of the ideas was to set the film in a high-rise apartment building. Eventually, it was changed to the hospital setting. After NBC had picked up the broadcast rights for the first film, they had requested a few additional scenes to fill out the time slot. While thinking about what he could add, Carpenter claims that at two in the morning, thanks to a six pack of beer, he came up with the idea that Lori was Michael's sister. This lent to something motivating Michael in the second film, as well as gave Carpenter some fodder to use for the extra scenes for the original film. He says Vader's twist in The Empire Strikes Back influenced him to do this. Carpenter has said that was a horrible decision and has helped ruin the rest of the franchise. Who can argue with him? It has caused problems anytime a new movie has been made. When they were working on part four, 
they had to work around the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis wasn't going to return, so they gave her an off-screen death and an orphan daughter, or abandoned, if you take into account that Laurie claimed to have faked her death in H2O. In part six, he is chasing down his possibly incestuously fathered baby. In H2O, he's back after his miraculously revived sister. In Resurrection, we find out his brother is Busta Rhymes. Okay, not really, but it'd still be better than what we got. This familia connection has plagued the series ever since Carpenter himself said, quote, the brother thing was awful, just awful. But here we are. With the script written, Carpenter then turned to Tommy Lee Wallace to direct the film. Wallace had been a production designer and editor on the first film. He was excited about it, as he had some ideas of his own for what a sequel should be. Once Carpenter handed him the script, his excitement fell. After the first film, the slasher boom had started to take effect. All of these films seemed to revel in the excitement of upping the blood and nudity to pull in audiences. To be fair, it worked. Wallace was hoping to keep the slow-moving, blood-free approach to the film like they used in the first one. He rejected the offer to direct, but would come back to direct Halloween 3. Where Halloween got it done with suggestion and shadows and true old-school suspense technique, somehow to me, Halloween 2 was summed up with that like hypodermic in the eyeball. With this, Carpenter had to find another director, and Rick Rosenthal was hired. One of the criticisms of this film is that Michael looks so different. There are varying stories as to why the mask itself looks different. Some say that Nick Castle would shove the mask in his pocket between takes on the original movie. This would have caused the white spray paint to begin to come off, revealing the flesh color underneath, giving it a weird yellow effect. Another story is that Deborah Hill had put the mask into a box and stored it under a bed after the first movie. She was an avid smoker, and the years of exposure to cigarette smoke yellowed it. On top of this, Dick Warlock was brought in to play the shape this time around, after scaring director Rick Rosenthal. Warlock saw the mask and put it on and then stood unmoving in Rosenthal's office. He didn't speak when asked who he was multiple times by the director. When he took off the mask, he asked if he could play the part and the director hired him. While he had the attitude down, he was actually smaller in stature than Nick Castle. He wore lifts to try to make himself seem taller, but the mask still didn't fit the same way it had on Castle. This led to the character appearing slightly off in this film. When Jamie Lee Curtis signed on to the movie, it was noted that she had cut her hair closer to the shorter hairstyle she has become famous for. She ended up having to wear a wig for the movie. In various shots, you can see that her hair seems to be different. While this normally could just be chalked up to it being a few years between films, this time it was because of the wig. Both Michael and Lori seem off in this movie. Maybe this lends credence to my dream theory. Hashtag Lori's dream theory. One piece of trivia you can use to impress your friends is that Jamie Lee Curtis has played Lori Strode in six different decades. Halloween in 1978, Halloween 2 in 1981, Halloween H2O 20 years later in 1998, Halloween Resurrection in 2002, Halloween 2018, and Halloween Kills 2021. When Rick Rosenthal turned in his cut, John Carpenter was not impressed. On the other hand, I think Halloween 2 is, is an abomination and a horrible movie. I was really disappointed in it. Mm. And, but I don't think the director has gone on and done some other films. I think his career is launched now. But I don't think he had a feel for the material. Yeah. I think that's the problem. He didn't have a feeling for what was going on. He called it about as scary as an episode of Quincy M.E. Carpenter took to re-editing the film to up the tension and showcase more of the kills. He even went back and shot some new scenes and inserts to make the film even gorier than before. It's a good thing Tommy Lee Wallace decided to pass. With a higher body count, more blood, and some nudity, Carpenter felt it had a better shot at making money at the box office. Rosenthal was livid at this and has been very outspoken about it. He would get another shot at Michael Myers with Halloween Resurrection. It didn't help his case any. One thing Carpenter did leave in was Dana Carvey's excellent appearance as a new assistant. While it does have its fair share of detractors, the film does have some good points. Even though it moved away from the more subtle and blood-free storytelling, some of the kills in the film make it fun. The nurse getting scalded in the hot tub is gruesome and looks great. Apparently, she got an ear infection from the not-so-clean water. Gross. The scalpel in the back always makes my stomach drop, even if the lifting of the nurse in the air makes no sense. But the saddest death in the whole film has to be the young man that was mistaken for Michael Myers and rammed with a police car. Turns out, that is the boy that Lori has a crush on, Ben Tramer. Man, she not only lost all of her friends, but also her hopeful future boyfriend. Lori has had a rough life. No wonder she was an alcoholic in H2O. 
While Michael would go on to stalk more family members in other films, this was the one that gave us his connection to Laurie Strode. For better or worse, this entry would influence every Halloween film that came after it. Even if you're not a fan of the twist, you have to agree that this is all a dream in Laurie's head up until the 2018 reboot. I'm making this happen whether you like it or not. Hashtag Laurie's Dream Theory. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends you like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company and we appreciate your support. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, please leave them in the comments below.